the gentleman from Florida. Now I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Tiffany. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Let me follow up on that. Um, Sheriff, do you believe the United States government has control of the um, border here with Mexico? I, I believe that we are trying and our Border Patrol partners are trying very hard, but the cartels are the ones that are creating the narrative and controlling the activities all along the 2,000 miles of international boundary. Do you have the ability to identify migrants who are inadmissible to the United States for criminal reasons or prior deportations? We do not have access to that. Is ICE or CBP actively assisting you in processing the migrants in your, in your charge? In, in the law enforcement aspect, we work with them quite a bit in regards to those that are in my jail. As far as the immigration side, that is something that is not in our wheelhouse. I can tell you that because of their constraints that I've actually cross-deputized our federal partners and the different entities to be able to seek cha state charges against individuals that the U.S. Attorney would not charge for crimes. Have you had, say that last part again. The United part in States regards Attorney. to the United, United States, States Attorney not wanting to charge an individual for a crime, then I've cross-deputized them so they could take that case to a county attorney to get prosecution. Have you had any detainers wow, issued by ICE for migrants in your facilities? Yes, I have. As a result of the illegal migration coming across our border, are they harming the environment? Absolutely. The, the vast amount of trash, pharmaceuticals, garbage, clothing that's being dumped along our river corridor it has been astronomical and the impacts for our farmers and their fields as well. When we had a hearing just a couple of weeks ago, we had a Judge San Diego from, I believe, El Paso and Sheriff Daniels on the panel and they had very divergent um, statements to say in regards to um, uh, in regards to fentanyl that the reason for fentanyl uh, the expansion of its use in our country and the devastating consequences was not because of the border being open that was the case being made by Judge Salmon Diego Sheriff Daniels said that it is a result of the borders being opened over the last couple years that fentanyl use and its um, migration into the United States has gone up expen exponentially. Um, who's correct? I will tend to support Sheriff Downell's <laughs> statement in regards to that. And I would agree with his statement as well. So um, you've seen, are you saying you've seen the same thing as Sheriff Daniels in Cochise County? We have seen the same type of activity where individuals were recruited to come and pick up individuals that had uh, entered this country illegally between a port of entry and come to pick them up because it's a money-making adventure. And they've also been uh, found to be in possession of narcotics, too, at the same time. Has Secretary Mayorkas secured the border? No. Uh, I just have one further question and a final statement, Mr. Chairman. Um, do any, uh, to Dr. Trenchell, do any of the NGOs out there, non-governmental organizations, um, have they compensated you for any of the uncompensated care that you're providing for migrants? No, they have not. We've not received any compensation from anyone. Thank you. I'm just going to close with this. You know, folks, set aside, we've had the no, most number of people that are on the terror watch come across our border in the last couple of years in the history of the United States of America. You can set aside the human trafficking. You have the largest, your, your United States government via the Biden administration is running perhaps the largest human trafficking or complicit in perhaps the greatest, um, biggest um, human trafficking operation in the history of the world along with the cartels, along with the International Organization of Migration, a United Nations outfit, and others. Set those things aside. Just fentanyl alone should be a national emergency in America, and I can't believe we do not have colleagues on the other side of the aisle that are not here today, and even if they're not here today, that are not calling for the same thing that we're calling for. At a minimum, secure the border to stop the fentanyl, or at least reduce the amount of fentanyl coming into America that is made 
every state, including my state of Wisconsin, a border state. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. Well done. For his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here. I really appreciate your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, when parents begin exercising their right to question their local school boards during the height of COVID, uh, amid mass mandates, woke curricula, and harassment in schools, how did the DOJ respond? The Department of Justice responded under Merrick Garland with directing the public to report threats of violence to school board members, officials, and workers in our national public schools to a national hotline. One particular case, a mom was reported to the hotline uh, as a threat because she was A, a conservative, and B, she was a lawful gun owner, like myself. The complainant alleged that the mom was a threat because she belonged to a right-wing group known as Moss for Liberty, and I have a real problem with identifying people like this because it's your right to belong to whoever you want to belong to, and that's your freedoms. Another investigation opened because a tip to the hotline, a, a dad was investigated uh, because according to the complainant, the dad fit the profile of an insurrectionist. I don't really know what that means, but it's, that's interesting. And he had a lot of guns and threatened to use them. Yet when the FBI asked about the complainant about these threats from the dad, the complainant admitted that no specific information or observations or any crimes of threats. According to the FBI, not one of these school board-related investigations resulted in federal arrests or charges, not a single one. Recently, the DOJ announced that they were going to continue to prosecute people from January 6th to the tune of around 1,000 more people to be charged in not-so-distant future. Now, January 6th was over two years ago, and the DOJ is still looking to charge more people. Yet, when there is a true domestic terror threat like Antifa, the DOJ did not direct people to a national hotline, nor did they report these threats to our communities. Now, my colleagues on the left will tell you that Antifa doesn't exist. It's an idea. Uh, but I, my question is, is, where is the intellectual curiosity to determine how Antifa, a highly coordinated domestic terrorist organization, is funded and organized? The DOJ did not set up a hotline for Antifa. They set up a hotline for you. No federal resources were set aside to investigate the violence that we saw unleashed across this country during the summer of love in 2020. Please note some of these photos. That's, wait a minute, that's not January 6th. That's May 31st, 2020. That's right in front of the White House. That's where the president lives. And at the time, President Trump was ushered into a bunker because his life was being threatened. Where was the hotline? Next photo. <laughs> That's not January 6th either. That's July 27th. That is in Portland. And that is Antifa rioting and pillaging our country. Where was the hotline? Next slide. Well, hot damn. <laughs> That's not January 6th either. Those are more rioters that are destroying and rioting in Salt Lake City. Next slide. I believe, that, is that it? We're, we're, <laughs> but wait, there's more. And that's not January 6th either. That's, that's June 1st, 2020. And that's the streets of D.C. that are being rioted and pillaged, and pillaged are by, by rioters. Where's the outrage? Where's the hotline? This is what domestic terror looks like. This is not a school board meeting. There is no hotline for any of these riots, and we are going to have a hotline that's going to report parents for caring about their children's education. And even further, the DOJ would rather investigate 1,000 more people from January 6th than any single person in these photos. What a shame. And that is why this is no longer the Department of Justice. It is the Department of Subjective Justice. And with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes next, gentleman from Georgia. Back chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. Dettelbach, are, are you troubled by the rule? I mean, you told him one thing 10 years ago, and now you're 
directly contradicting that. Uh, the the, uh, stable, the stabilizing brace short barrel rifle rule, I assume, is the rule you're, you're referring I'm, I'm to. I'm referring to the letter that was sent back on November 26, 2012, that Mr. Nell's referenced in his first line of questioning, where sure. you told so, you uh, told the FTB finds that the submitted brace, when attached to a forearm, excuse me, a firearm, does not convert the weapon and would not alter its classification. Uh, now you're doing we, just, we, just the opposite. We have been, we have been public and in the rulemaking itself have detailed that history and there were inconsistencies. However, there was also a situation, Mr. Chairman, where people were marketing products that had never been presented to ATF saying that they were Was ATF that the only approved. time you told them, the only time you told the American people that it was okay? No, we, we look at specific well, let me read, products. Let me, read this, let me read this letter, March 5th, 2014, because this doesn't so much focus on the brace focused on how the weapons used it. We have determined that firing a pistol from the shoulder would not cause the pistol to be reclassified as a short barrel rifle. We did not classify weapons based on how individuals used the weapon. So you told them not once, but twice that it was okay. And I'm just asking, does it bother you now that you are doing, you're making the change that's gonna impact millions of Americans? The rule was necessary in part because it needed to address inconsistency so that people could understand the definition of a short I just read two rifle. letters that were consistent. Both of them there, said it was fine. There were other letters that were not. Have you, have you ever found, has ATF ever found itself in this position where a rule change directly contradicts what you've told American citizens was okay and that's going to impact millions? millions of law-abiding citizens. Have you ever found yourself in that situation? Uh, respectfully, I don't believe that's the, the uh, uh, I agree millions with that of summary of where we are. Millions of Americans aren't, Americans aren't gonna were, be impacted? There, no, there were specific products that get presented for classification. Those products then sometimes change. They're not the same ones that are marketed. A and there was, I, there was inconsistency. The market is dynamic. It was necessary to do what it, notice and comment rulemaking, I think, is a better way to do I think millions of Americans that. think the inconsistency is with the ATF because you told them one thing and now you're changing. What happens on May 31st? Oh, on, um, according to the rule. No, what happens on May 31st? According to the rule, people have, from the date the rule was, was published until that date, uh, to, to do one of several things. They can either detach the brace from the firearm and keep both, uh, uh, and they can attach that How about brace this? to another one. They, they got to remove or destroy the brace, get a longer barrel, turn in or destroy the firearm, or register the firearm. Is that right? They got to do the, one they of those four things. They have to apply to register whether or not the application is ruled on. They're allowed to keep the, the, the item during that entire time so that they're not uh, held if accountable for any If they don't do that period. and the timeline runs out, what happens? to those individuals. They, know, they don't do those four things and the timeline is expired, what happens well, then? I, I assume that people who uh, are no, aware- I'm not asking, what, what happens if they don't do those well, four things? Well, I, I think that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as a prosecutor, I, I just wanna be accurate. What happens, a former prosecutor, what happens is, depending on the circumstance, if a person is unaware, right? They, they're not gonna be prosecuted for things that let's they're cut, unaware of. Let's cut to the chase, of. they could be a felon, right? Well, it, could be it, a felon. It, it depends on the facts and circumstances of each case. And of course, we would prioritize enforcement on gang members who are having these How items are you? and you shooting mentioned people. enforcement. How are you going to enforce this? Uh, you going to go to gun ranges? What See, we will do is... You're going to go to manufacturers and look at the risk of people they sold braces to? What we, will, what we will do is we will, when we do a search warrant in a drug case and we discover an unlawful item, whether it's a machine gun or a Glock switch or a short-barreled rifle that doesn't comply, we will consider that as one of the charges. There's no plan. Does the, gun, to, does to the gun Control Act or the National Firearms Act clearly and unambiguously prohibit pistol braces? Uh, it, pro, it doesn't prohibit anything. It calls for increased controls on short-barreled rifles. Not the gun control, but I'm just reading from the court decision yesterday in the Sixth Circuit where the, the, the judge oh, said I'm sorry. the statute does not clearly and unambiguously prohibit bump stocks. The court went on to say for a decade the ATF has maintained that a bump stock is not a machine gun part, and the court said the ATF's own flip-flop on this position is one of the reasons why they ruled in favor of those opposing the rule you guys made. Seems to me we're in the same situation here. And yesterday, the Sixth Circuit gave us a strong ruling on the bump stock issue. I would anticipate that we're going to get other strong rulings on this issue as well. With that, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from Washington.
thank you. And I just want to address Mr. Johnson, who said uh, you brought the receipts. Well, Mr. Johnson, I've got some receipts for you. This committee met about two months ago, and the chairman, who can call any person in the world who walks this earth as a witness, called this guy, who tweeted just a couple weeks before the hearing, fuck cops. Your witness tweeted that. Not one of you disavowed that guy. Not one of you said that was inappropriate. I was stunned that you call yourself a pro-police party and you bring a witness before us that says, fuck cops. I don't believe in that, but I thought if you didn't believe in that, you would have taken the opportunity to say it. But no, not only did you not disavow it, you invited the guy here in Congress to be your witness. Imagine if we had ever done that. We didn't. You did. Second, I would love Mr. Johnson to disavow, because by the way, I will disavow the defund the police movement. I've never called for it. I believe just as President Biden believes when he addressed Congress that we should fund the police. But Mr. Johnson, will you disavow your colleague, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who tweets out and makes money off of a defund the FBI movement? Because they're police too. They protect us too. But I don't think you will. I think you're going to sit silent. And your silence, by the way, is complicity. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from uh, Virginia is recognized. We'll jump. Yield to the gentleman from Arizona. Thank, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I uh, appreciate uh, the backpedaling at an alarming rate from the other side. Watch out. You might fall over backwards. We have a video to play. Uh, I think this will provide some visual summation, please. And the police has to happen. We need to defund the police. Mayor Eric Garcetti saying, take some of the money from policing, about $150 million. I applaud Eric Garcetti for doing what he's done. But we need to completely dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. It is outdated. It is wrong-headed thinking to think that the only way you're going to get communities to be safe is to put more police officers on the street. So yes, defund your butts. Defund you. Yes, I support the reallocation of resources uh, from NYPD. We will be moving funding from the NYPD. Yes, I support the defund movement. I'm for responsible reallocation of resources. And defund the police. I think you do all those other things, you don't need all the money that's going to the police department. So yeah, I mean, the spirit of it, I, I, I do support that. Yeah, and you know, a lot of us were asked if we could imagine a future without police back in 2017 when we were, when we were running for office. And I answered yes to that question. We are going to reduce funding in the police department and redirect that money. We propose to redirect over $7 million from the police bureau. The, the police department here in Minneapolis needs to be dismantled, and we need to start anew. In some necessary cases, completely dismantling those police forces. Police departments uh, are taking a sizable uh, amount of the budget of a lot of municipalities and, and other entities. Uh, we need to look at those budgets, pull some of the money back. But we talk about defunding the police, uh, Defund, defunding the Pentagon. My push is that we defund our police departments. Defunding police means defunding police. If these reports are accurate, then these proposed cuts to the NYPD budget are a disingenuous illusion. This is not a victory. The freshman Democrat adding the fight to defund policing will continue. Mr. Chairman, um, I also have several articles that I would like to submit for the record. Instead of reading all the titles, I'll just provide those to you, if that's okay. Without objection. And I'll yield back to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Would the gentleman yield? Yield to the chair. Yeah, I would just say, in, in response to, to uh, the gentleman from California, of course we disavow that tweet. That is obvious. And if we'd have known that individual had, had that tweet out there, I doubt if he'd have been invited as a witness. Uh, with that, I yield back to the gentleman from Virginia. Gentleman yields back. 2020, uh, refuting claims that uh, Acting Secretary Wolf uh, was uh, acting uh, or was appointed unlawfully uh, and providing the legal justification uh, for his appointment without objection. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Roy for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Um, Mr. Reichel Melnick, let me ask you a question. Is Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, is he a racist? Uh, I 
Can't comment on that. Okay, what about Mark Kelly from Arizona? Similarly cannot comment on that. Maggie Hessen? Also Senator cannot comment. New Hampshire? Okay. Can't comment on there being a racist or not. How about Senator Raphael Warnock from Georgia? Similarly, I'm, I'm not familiar. Okay. How about Catherine Cortez Masso from Nevada? Likewise, Mr. Rowe. Okay. Can't comment on whether they're racist or not. I, I don't have an opinion as to the matter. Okay. Because you called me a racist. And I, you called me a racist because I said that Title 42 should be enforced. Something, by the, by the way, that this administration did to the tune of over a million people. I um, believe it's about 2.5 million people. Uh, actually. Right. So this administration is racist? Uh, I believe this administration has made a number of failures in the racial justice front. So the Biden administration is racist? I, I can't comment as the administration Interesting. in general. Interesting. Good to know. Good to know that the Biden administration is racist and get that on the record. Uh, the fact is, people who want to enforce Title 42 believe that there was a reason that Title 42 was put in place, but they also recognize that Title 42 is, in fact, a Band-Aid on a very broken system where the laws were not being enforced otherwise. But to throw around words like racist, let me ask you a, a question. Is my friend... Uh, Henry Cuellar, is he a racist? I can't comment on that. Right, because Henry Cuellar said the border community is very concerned about Title 42 being lifted. This message of lifting Title 4 is going straight to the criminal organizations. He stood up and said that Title 42 should be enforced. The administration stood up. The senators I just listed said that Title 42 should have stayed in place. Now, my personal view is that Title 42 wasn't the thing that needed to stay in place. That what ought to be in place is an actual border security that secures the border. Mr. Wolf in your position at the head of the Department of Homeland Security, notwithstanding what my colleagues want to throw around with the ad hominem attacks, uh, you were in fact in charge with securing the homeland, right? That was actually your task, yes. securing the homeland at the Department of Homeland Security? That's correct. Right, and did you do that? Yes. Right, and is the current administration securing the homeland? No. No, in any measure, in any way, shape, or form, is the current Secretary of Homeland Security carrying out his duty faithfully under the Constitution to secure the homeland of the United States. He is not. As I've outlined in my written testimony and oral testimony, there's numerous instances where he is not faithfully um, executing the law. I think, I thank you, Secretary Wolf. What I would say is, uh, if you go back to April of 2022, in a Judiciary Committee hearing, I read word for word the statutory definition of operational control under the Secure Fence Act. I read it sitting right over here. There was a chart, and I put up the chart. I put up the text, and the text says, operational control means the prevention of all unlawful entries into the United States, including entries by terrorists, other unlawful aliens, instruments of terrorism, narcotics, and other contraband. I asked Secretary Mayorkas, do you have operational control? And his response was, I do. And Congressman, I think the Secretary of Homeland Security would have said the same thing in 2020 and 2019. In March of 2023, however, in a Senate hearing, Secretary Marcus said, quote, with respect to the definition of operational control, I do not use the definition that appears in the Secure Fence Act. And the Secure Fence Act provides statutorily that operational control is defined as preventing all unlawful entries in the United States by that definition, no administration has ever had operational control. Just two weeks prior, United States Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortiz answered, no, sir, when asked by Homeland Security Chairman Mark Green, does DHS have operational control of the entire southwest border? So the United States Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortiz says, we do not have operational control of the border. He answered straight up, truthfully, no, sir. Why was it that the Secretary of Homeland Security, when I asked him that question, he said, yes, we have operational control. He said, I do, to be more precise. But then, in the Senate, he comes back and says, oh, but no, I'm sorry, if you use that definition, you know, the one in the statute, uh, no, no one has ever had operational control. What is your response to that? And how would you characterize having operational control of the border as you uh, would say in the uh, previous administration compared to current? Well, I would certainly talk about my time in the Trump administration. And if I were to get asked that question, whether we had operational control, the answer was no, we did not. Uh, neither was the border secure. And I think words matter here. Those are very definitive statements. I always talked about how we were making the border more secure or it was the most secure in our lifetime. Uh, but to say that you have complete operational control, to say that the border is closed, to say that it is secure, you're hiding the ball from the American people. You're not being transparent. 
And it's for a purpose, uh, I think you can only guess, a political purpose, uh, but it also defies what the men and women of the Border Patrol and others are doing down there. When they see their political leadership make these sorts of statements, it, it, it's, it, <laughs> it's so bad it's hard to find words. They, they don't know what to think because they are on the line. They are on that border every single day watching the hundreds of thousands of individuals walk past them that they have to process and they see that someone is saying that this border is secure, or you see the 200 known or suspected terrorists that have come across this border in the last two years, but somehow that border is closed and secure. I don't understand it. Yeah, kind of like accusing people of whipping migrants at the border. I yield back. Time's up. A recent poll found that 37% of Americans have a positive view of the FBI. And that's from an NBC poll. I wouldn't exactly call that uh, right media propaganda, and I think I know why. Here's what the American people know and believe about the FBI today, sir. If you are a Trump, you'll be prosecuted. If you are a Biden, you'll be protected. And the American people that I represent are sick and tired of this double standard. It seems like every single hearing that we have in this room, we talk about the two-tiered justice system of Biden DO, uh, Biden's DOJ and the FBI, and as we were talking earlier, here we are again. President Trump endured an unprecedented raid at his home in Mar-a-Lago. President Biden's home, however, was respectfully browsed. President Trump is facing up to 400 years in federal prison for allegedly being in possession of classified documents he obtained as the commander-in-chief of these United States of America. And meanwhile, President Biden is facing no charges for the classified documents he had held at his time as a senator and a vice president, not the president of these United States of America. And last I checked, he had no legal authority to declassify those documents. Assuming President Trump was in possession of said classified documents, would those documents be more secure, surrounded by Secret Service at Mar-a-Lago, or in a box, in a garage, behind your Corvette? You know the answer to that question. Question for you, sir. What can you tell us about the status of the FBI's investigation of President Biden's classified documents found next to his Corvette in Delaware and those found at the Penn Biden Center? Do we have an update on that, sir? What I can tell you is that there is an ongoing special counsel investigation led by Mr. Robert Herr, uh, and we have FBI agents uh, affiliated with it, working on it, working very actively and aggressively with him on that case. Um, I obviously disagree with your description of the two standards. In my view, we, at least under my watch, we have one standard, okay. uh, and that is we're going to pursue the facts wherever they lead, no matter who likes it. And I add that last part because especially in sensitive investigations, mm -hmm. Almost by definition, somebody's not going to like it. So I understand, and that's actually why I led with the sentiment of the American people. I understand that, that, it's, that's it's your a, sentiment. So Let me, I, I do want to finish this. So, so I want everybody to talk about this dichotomy that we have seen. I, I, I get your point, sir, but that's just not what we see as the public, as we the people. We see one case being fa fast-tracked and one case being slow-walked. We see one president's home being raided, the other president's home being kindly searched. You have one government agency the Secret Service, protecting the former president and his home, and another government agency, the FBI, raiding the same home. Now, to me, sir, that's tragically ironic. And we expect more from a functional constitutional republic, and these things shouldn't be happening. Now, it's my opinion that Joe Biden is the most unpopular president we have seen in a century, and that's why he knows the only way to stop President Trump from beating him in November is by putting him in jail. You talked about this, Mr. Fry. In the 247 years of this existence of this great nation, only one president has ever been indicted by the DOJ and has home raided by the FBI. Now, some have said that President Trump's indictment means that no one is above the law. Okay, all right, I would love to see that. But what about Hillary Clinton? And what about Joe Biden? And what about Hunter Biden, who is America's favorite son? And let me tell you something. I got a four-year-old daughter and a two-year-old daughter at my house. Hunter Biden, to me, is like glitter. He is on everything, and you cannot get rid of him. And yet nothing is going to be done about this. We're sick of it. 
James Comey decided not to prosecute Hillary Clinton despite overwhelming evidence that she committed crimes. And as I recall, it was the position of the FBI to not prosecute because they didn't want to interfere with the presidential election. What do you call this? The Iowa caucuses are in six months. Six months. I think the American public would expect to see this from Cuba and from Venezuela and from Russia and from China, but not here. The people expect us to have blind justice. They expect equal justice under the law. It is not the job of the DOJ or the FBI to prosecute Joe Biden's top political opponent who was leading in every single primary poll, and the Iowa caucuses are in six months. Let the people decide. It's our job to uphold the Constitution. As a West Point grad and military veteran, this is the Constitution I give my life to protect, and I expect us all to uphold it likewise. Thank you so much for being here. Mr. Chairman, may I briefly respond? Sure. Uh, so, number one, as to the investigations related to Mrs. Clinton, as you noted, that happened under my predecessor, and I'm not going to speak that. for or defend that decision. I recognize that. Second, uh, as to your descriptions of the investigations uh, related to uh, Hunter Biden, uh, as you know, there is an ongoing investigation being led by the Delaware U.S. Attorney appointed by President Trump, and we are actively working on that investigation with him. Well, we, look, we, look, and we, look, we look forward to seeing the results of this quickly and swiftly. And, and third and finally, uh, to your point about the American people mm -hmm. and their views, uh, I worry less about NBC polls or polls by any other news outlet, uh, but I will tell you that it, the number of people in Texas applying to work for us since I've been in this job has gone up 93%, and in fact, I'm not going to quote Matt Gates. I, 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 heard, I, heard, I heard his response to this earlier. In fact, <laughs> we have <laughs> That's great. more applicants, more applicants from the state of Texas annually in the last several years than any other state in the country. And that makes sense because Texas is the greatest state in the country. Then I think that speaks very well of the view of Texans yeah. about the FBI. Director, any oh. agents who served on the Crossfire Hurricane investigation or the Mueller investigation, are any of those agents on Mr. Hur or Mr. Smith's special counsel team? I don't believe so, but I can't, on the top of my head, go through the list of, there's a lot of agents involved in the two investigations, and so um, let me check into that and see if there's any way we can get back to on that, because I don't want to get out over my skis. Thank you. Gentleman uh, from uh, Wisconsin is recognized. Uh, I don't believe anybody has lost a security clearance, but again, we have an internal review pending, and that, and that I'll let that finish to it, come to its conclusion. How did you become aware of the Catholic memo that the I gentleman did. just referenced? How did I become aware of it? Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman may state his point of order. Uh, whose time is the chairman uh, consuming with uh, his? I thought for the committee, uh, it's not a point of order. The chair now recognizes the gentleman for Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I will say this, Mr. Ray, I, I am one of those sheriffs that will, will be very blunt with you today. That's right here. I, I've had an opportunity to look at your testimony, lots of stuff, and hear about numerous task forces, crimes being committed against children, including even infants and to toddlers, MS-13 gang members coming across the open southern border, the poisoning and killing of the American people with fentanyl, the, the sex trafficking, the human trafficking, it's quite clear, it is clear that you guys are dealing with some of the sickest bastards in our society. I have an article here from CNN in January 2022 calling the January 6th investigation the biggest investigation in FBI history. And what shocks me about this, quite honestly, is that you don't mention January 6th. Again, the biggest investigation, not one time in your 14-page testimony. You don't mention it one time. And that makes me ask myself the question, what the hell are you hiding? Sir, you mentioned 38,000 agents and support personnel in your agency. How many FBI agents and support personnel have you assigned to the January 6th investigation? I don't know that I know the number. I know we have a lot of people working okay, on it in multiple fields. Fair offices. enough, lots. Yeah. Knowing that you are dealing with some of the sickest people in our society with investigations related to child sex trafficking, have you reassigned any of these agents or personnel to investigate January 6th? Yes or no? 
I, I don't believe we have reassigned people away from uh, child exploitation okay. to January I, 6th. Now, but now, but let me just say this, Director. I, I, I find that answer knowledge. disturbing because last month, Steve Friend, he testified before the Weaponization Committee. Mr. Friend was a domestic terror investigator for you, and he was told by one of his superiors that January 6th was, I quote, a higher priority than pursuing child pornography cases, end quote. And for those of you watching in America, understand today's FBI is more concerned about searching for and arresting grandma and grandpa for entering the Capitol building that day than pursuing the sick individuals in our society who prey on our children. And Mr. Ray, your priorities are flawed. But let's rehash what we know so far. All right, it's the largest investigation in FBI history, and you don't mention it in your testimony. Agents have been reassigned from child exploitation cases and so on. So now let's get into the money, Mr. Ray. How much taxpayer money has been spent on January 6th? I don't know that I have the figure. Oh, you don't have on it. My okay, head, fine. But Mr. Ray, I got an article here, uh, December 22. Uh, 2022, two years after the events of January 6th, and it says the Justice Department has requested another $34 million from Congress. And uh, number one, you shouldn't get another dime. The FBI shouldn't get another dime for this political witch hunt against the greatest president in my lifetime, Donald J. Trump. I, I want to turn my attention now to this fella, this character, Mr. Ray Epps. We've all heard of him. We've heard of Mr. Ray Epps. He was number 16 on your FBI Most Wanted list. He was encouraging people the night prior and the day of to go into the Capitol. And Mr. Ray Epps can be seen at the first breach of Capitol grounds at approximately 12.50 p.m. Play the clip, please. We need to go into the Capitol. Into the Capitol. Into the Capitol. Hey, what? All right, no, Dave, but one more thing. Yeah, so can we go up there? No? When we go in, are we going to get arrested if we go up there? Yeah. You don't need to get shot. Arrest us. Breaching the line, going in at the first breach into the Capitol, into the Capitol grounds, a restricted area. Mr. Ray, you have arrested hundreds of people related to January 6th. And there have been people arrested for breaching Capitol grounds. Cooey Griffin is an example. Rachel Genko is an example. And then we go to Mr. Brandon Strecka. Brandon was arrested for disorderly and disruptive conduct which included yelling, I quote, go, 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 as rioters tried to empty the Capitol. These three never went into the Capitol. They never assaulted anyone. So let's be honest with each other. There is very little difference between the actions of Ray Epps and Brandon Stricka that day, but yet Stricka was arrested and Epps wasn't. Epps also testified to the January 6th committee. He was back at his hotel when video evidence showed that he wasn't. He lied. He was on the Capitol grounds just as Brandon Strecka was. Epps even texted his nephew at 2.12 p.m. and said, I quote, I was in the front with a few others. It was on the video. I also orchestrated it. Now look into the camera, sir, when you answer my next question. Are you going to arrest Mr. Epps, yes or no? I'm not going to engage here in a discussion about individual people who are okay, or are not going to be prosecuted. Can I get a commitment? You just watched the video. I'm an old law dog. I understand a little bit about probable cause. He did very little. There was very little difference what he did. And Mr. Strecker, you can see him. He's encouraging. I almost think he's inciting a riot. He's encouraging people the night prior to go into the Capitol, the day of, go into the Capitol. And he was at the first breach and he breached the restricted area. Everybody, a lot of people getting arrested for not going into the Capitol, but they're in the restricted area. But yet, Ray Epps, who many people feel, fed, 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 right? And there's a lot of cloud over this. So I, I, my point is this. You arrested a lot of folks for unlawful activity. You just saw the video. And I will tell I you, Mr. Ray, Mr. Uh, if you don't yeah. arrest Mr. Epps, the there's gentleman. a reason behind it. I believe you know what it is. And it appears to me you are protecting this guy. I strongly recommend you get your house back in order. With that, I yield back. 
Mr. Chairman, if I might briefly. Gentlemen, we respond, then we've got a couple point of orders. Uh, it is not never, unanimous consent, excuse me. Go ahead. It, it has never been appropriate for an FBI director in congressional testimony to be weighing in on who is or isn't going to be arrested and what, who is or isn't going to get charged, which is a prosecutor's decision. If you are suggesting that the violence that at, Cap at the Capitol on January 6th was part of some operation orchestrated by FBI sources or FBI agents, the answer is no, it was not. And to suggest otherwise is a disservice to our hardworking, dedicated law enforcement profession. Can I respond to that now that uh, the, the point is, he was number 16 on your list. Yeah, the, the, he was 16 on your list. You never arrested the him. Gentleman the hundreds of Americans were arrested. Has expired. Shame on you. The chair recognizes the Thanks, sir. The chair yields to Ms. Hageman for five minutes. Thank you. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution rests on the principle that no person or institution, including the government, has a monopoly on the truth, and that viewpoint-based suppression of speech by the government is dangerous and may even spell the death of a constitutional republic. Under the First Amendment, the government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. As the Supreme Court has explained, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion. Labeling speech, mis speech misinformation does not strip it of its First Amendment protection. That is so even if the speech is untrue, as some false statements are inevitable if there is to be an open and vigorous expression of views in public and private conversation. In refusing to carve out a First Amendment exception for false speech, the framers of our Constitution rec recognize the significant danger in making the government the ultimate arbiters of truth. And it is axiomatic in the words of the Supreme Court that the government may not induce, encourage, or promote private persons to accomplish what it constitutionally for, is forbidden to accomplish. Secretary Mayorkas, it was reported in May that the DHS, through the Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Grant Program, is funding groups targeting conservatives and equating them to domestic terrorists. Originally intended to combat foreign terrorist organizations' operations in the U.S., it has become yet another government tool weaponized against citizens to violate First Amendment protection affiliate, uh, protected affiliations and speech. One grant to the University of Dayton for a program titled Provence O hosted a seminar titled Extremism, Rhetoric, and Democratic Precarity. One of the speakers, a known Antifa member, as part of his presentation shared a pyramid of far-right radicalization, which likened the Republican Party to the, the Heritage Foundation, the American Conservative Union, Fox News, Breitbart News, the National Rifle Association, Prager University, Tea Party Patriots, the MAGA movement, and the, the, the pro-police Blue Lives Matter movement, and the Christian Broadcasting Network as the first steps on path leading to Nazism and militant neo-Nazism, among other appalling ideologies and groups. This presenter reportedly also taught tactics on how to pressure the removal of conservatives from platforms, and he's even quoted as saying, a lot of things we are doing are illegal, and a lot of it involves breaking the law. Secretary Mayorkas, does the affiliation with conservative or Christian beliefs make someone a Nazi or a domestic terrorist? Of course not. Okay. Then if that's so, why uh, is your agency targeting Americans uh, who are Christians and conservatives? We are not. Okay. Secretary Mayorkas, when did you become aware that the University of Dayton was implementing your grant funding program to target conservatives and Christians? It is my understanding that it is not. When did you become, so you have, you're not aware of that? No, it is my understanding that it is not. You're unaware of the information that has been produced, and have you ever seen the pyramid that it's up on the screen right now? I, uh, I learned about the individual speaker's comments with which I profoundly disagree. Okay, so when did you find about, out about the speaker's comments? I don't quite uh, recall, Congresswoman. All right, well, you know what? I, I'm, Mr. Mayorkas, I actually really want to thank you as well for coming here today, for your performance. I have watched with absolute fascination as you have danced and dodged and lied, yes, lied, 
We know you've lied, you know you've lied, but more importantly, the American public knows that you lied throughout your testimony today. And yet you believe that you and your fellow architects of the censorship industrial complex think that you should be able to determine what is and isn't true and what is and isn't untrue. You are the walking, talking epitome of the very tyrant that our forefathers recognized would gravitate towards government service. And it is because of people like you that they drafted the First Amendment. I thank them for their foresight. I thank them for recognizing that you and people like you would do everything in your power to control speech, to control freedom, to take away our rights. And they've written a document that isn't going to allow you to do that. Unfortunately, we still have courts and judges who recognize that you don't have the power that you are attempting to take, that you do not have the right to limit our freedom of speech, our freedom of association, our right to communicate. Thank God we have the First Amendment so that we can stop you from doing what you've been doing. With that, I yield back. Your accusations are false. Recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I have listened both in here and in, in my <clears throat> office today, uh, your testimony uh, before this committee. And I think the frustration that I have as the cleanup crew at the very end of this committee is that you seem to ver answer very eloquently all the questions that the other side of the aisle pose, but when posed with questions, specific questions, about the border on this side of the aisle, you seem to not have, you seem to dance and dodge, as Ms. Hageman talked about, uh, the true answers that you, you talk about, uh, you, you filibuster, if you will, what people really are asking. And these, are, these aren't questions that, that are hatched out of uh, some think tank, these are questions that our citizens have because they see what's going on. You know, what's remarkable to me since day one of this administration, you've terminated construction of the border wall, you restricted the ability of immigration officers to deport aliens who violate U.S. law, you terminated the MPP, the Remain in Mexico policy, despite people on the ground talking about how successful that it was, you abused parole authority to release illegal aliens en masse into the United States, um, and, and creating categorical, categorical parole programs in violation of the ANA's case-by-case -case basis. You refused to follow federal law requiring aliens to be detained during the pendency of their asylum proceedings. You terminated asylum cooperative agreements with Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. You refused to comply with the provisions of the INA that require the detention of asylum seekers. You cut, out, you cut out immigration judges, ICE attorneys, and the process of the asylum system itself. You support sanctuary city, city policies by giving them grants. You implemented until it was enjoined a 100-day moratorium on alien removals. You have misused, as been talked about here, the CBP-1 app that has institutionalized mass parole and release policies in this country. It's been described as a shell game. Pretty pretty fairly stated, that you otherwise shift things around, you, you create definitions within your department that you think that are appropriate, you create law, which isn't your function, uh, and then you come before Congress and you say that everything is fine. Well, we've been to Yuma, Arizona, sir, um, and we've seen the devastation down there. We've talked to people. Seventy sheriffs just last year said that there is no border at all. We simply have no border left in Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, and Texas. That's the National Sheriff's Association. You've been held to account by courts. Texas v. Biden, DHS's position, quote, position that the crisis at the border is not largely of their own making because of their more lenient detention policies is divorced from reality and belied by the evidence. Florida versus the United States in the nor Northern District of Florida, quote, the Biden administration have effectively turned the southwest border into a meaningless line in the sand and little more than a speed bump for aliens flooding into the country by prioritizing alternatives for detention over actual detention and by releasing more than a million aliens into the country. Uh, real quick, let's play a video. Crisis on the border that just keeps getting worse. These are live pictures of Del Rio, Texas. Uh, town that borders Mexico, where almost 9,000 migrants are currently camping out. Government data showing there were more than 220,000 encounters with migrants along the border last month, the highest number in 22 years. Law 
enforcement leaders from federal, state, and local agencies announced Tuesday an unprecedented two-month-long fentanyl enforcement surge along the southwest border that resulted in the seizure of more than 4,700 pounds of fentanyl. Fentanyl being pushed through the desert around El Paso is up more than 355 percent compared to last year. For the first time, fentanyl is being smuggled between the ports of entry. There have been more than 200 people on the right, FBI terror watch crisis on the border that just keeps getting worse. So the numbers don't lie. 5.6 million illegal immigration or illegal alien encounters, 1.5 million known gotaways, more than 2.2 million illegal immigrants, aliens into this country, meaning that 3.6 million illegal aliens are in this country since the start of your tenure. That's astronomical. 160 countries, the people on the terror watch list that we know about, 140 just this year, it's at an all-time high. So look, this, 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 doesn't, this doesn't lie. These are the stats, Mr. Secretary. And so you come up here and you blame the former president, and they say that they've gutted the immigration system. You blame Congress for not acting. But you know what? These numbers weren't here for Obama. They weren't here for Trump. But they seem to be here for you. So you like to blame other people for your failures in not doing your job. And quite frankly, the American people want to know, how qualified are you to even carry out your mission? Because everybody else seems to indicate, from local law enforcement to sheriffs to ranchers to farmers to citizens on the border, when I ask them, is the border more secure, they say resoundingly no. And that's on your watch, sir. Without a yield. The gentleman floor is recognized five minutes. I guess I'm just wondering, Mr. Attorney General, has anyone at the department told President Biden to knock it off with Hunter? I mean, you guys are charging Hunter Biden on some crimes, investigating him on, on others. You've got the president bringing Hunter Biden around to state dinners. Has anyone told him to knock it off? Our job in the Justice Department is to pursue our cases without reference uh, to what's happening in the outside world. You, just that, yes or no, have you done that? That is what we do. So it's a no? No one that I know of has spoken to the White House about the Hunter Biden case. I'm wondering of course then, not. okay, I got it, I got it. So Hunter Biden is selling art to pay for his $15,000 a month rent in Malibu. How can you guarantee that the people buying that art aren't doing so to gain favor with the president? The job of the Justice Department is to investigate criminal allegations you have information. Are you investigating this? I mean, someone who bought Hunter Biden's art ended up with a prestigious appointment to a federal position. Doesn't it look weird that he's, making, he's become this immediate success in the art world as his dad is president of the United States? Isn't that odd? I'm not going to comment about any specific Not going to comment, not going to investigate. So right. Hunter Biden associate Devin Archer told us that Hunter sold the appearance of access to then Vice President Biden. Are you confident he has stopped doing that? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Hunter Biden associate Devin Archer told us that Hunter sold the appearance of access to then Vice President Biden. Are you confident he has stopped? I'm gonna say again that all these matters are within the purview of Mr. Weiss. I have not interfered with them, and yeah, I do not. Yeah, but if you were confident that he had stopped, you could And I do not intend to interfere with him. I wanna, so it was, a lot of Chinese money that was working its way through these shell companies into the accounts of the Biden family. So the China initiative was set up during the Trump administration at the Department of Justice to go after the malign influence of, of the Chinese Communist Party. And the Biden Justice Department dissolved the China initiative. So I guess I'm wondering, does the department have any documents uh, that would detail the basis for why you got rid of the China initiative that President Trump had set up. The Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division gave a long speech which explained that. He has testified before Congress several times. We'd be happy to provide you with What's the, the basis? Just tell us all now. What, why, why was the China initiative dissolved? What, uh, uh, the, what the Assistant Attorney General said was that we face attacks from four nation states, North Korea, China, Russia and Iran, and that we need to focus our attention on the broad range of these attacks. Sometimes we but, don't but, but wait know. A second. You don't, are you saying that North Korea has the same malign influence risk to the United States as the Chinese Communist Party? Are you, are you trying to represent there's some parity there? Because here's what it looks like. It looks like the Chinese 
gave all this money to the Bidens, and then you guys came in and got rid of the China initiative, and it was successful. Like, I, I saw one rationale that you guys got rid of the China initiative because it was racial profiling. But, but one of the people you convicted was a guy named Charles Lieber, who was a Harvard professor taking $50,000 a month to do China's bidding and give them whatever research was being done. Are, are you aware of the millions of dollars that moved through Rob Walker's shell companies from Chinese Communist Party entities into Biden family bank accounts? Are you aware of that? There were a lot of questions that you just asked. Let me start with the first one about North Korea. North Korea is a dangerous actor, both kinetically and with respect to cyber. But not on par with China. I'm on I'm the not, Armed Services I'm not Committee, in the Mr. Attorney right General. Now, it's, may, okay, it's, it makes you, you look unserious to suggest may that. May I answer your question or not? Answer the question about whether or not you know about all the millions of dollars that so moved you don't to want Rob me Walker's to answer into. about North Korea? I already know the answer, and so does everyone. They're not the same risk as China. So let's get on to serious questions and serious answers. Do you know about the money that moved through Rob Walker's shell companies, yes or no? As I have said repeatedly, I have left ma these matters to Mr. Weiss. I've not Blissfully intruded, ignorant. I've not interfered, Blissfully I've not tried things. to find out it's what like he knows. It's like you're looking the other way on purpose it's because everybody knows this stuff's happening. And you know what, people don't pay bribes to not get something in return. Right. We, the, the China initiative resulted in the convictions of a Harvard professor, of someone at Monsanto. So we were working against the Chinese. They paid the Bidens. And now we're, now you're sitting here telling me that I'm, North Korea is the big threat. I'm I got to get to this one thing on January well, 6th. I, I, so did the FBI, did the FBI lose count of the number of paid informants on January 6th? Let me did answer you? your question about China. I China want you to answer this question. I only get five minutes. You've already you, sort of, I think, screwed the pooch on China. So permitted. January 6th, did you lose count of the number of federal assets? Did you lose count and order an audit? Gentlemen, time has expired. I, I get an answer to the question of did, he, did they lose count? Well, of let the him number? answer the question. The time has expired. The, the Attorney General can respond. China is the most aggressive, most dangerous Mr. adversary Mr. General, the United States the faces, and we are doing everything within our power to rebut that, to stop that, to prevent their invasions, both kinetic, both um, and through cyberspace, and we will continue. If, you, if to do someone that. gave that answer in your courtroom when you were a judge, you would tell them they were being non-responsive, and you would direct them to answer the question. Point of order, your Honor. Time is. Badgering uh, the witness. Uh, point of time order, is please. expired. I, I got it. I just, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was. You like your Honor? You want to stick with that? Yeah, I, I was getting okay. laughed at to come with your honor. I Point of order either way. Okay, I understand that too. <laughs> All right. But the gentleman asked his question before his time expired. The attorney general did not respond to the gentleman's question. I was hoping he would respond to the question about the confidential human sources on January 6th. He didn't respond to that. I'm sure we're going to get, uh, uh, we're going to uh, get uh, an answer uh, to that uh, later. Of, of course, now, Mr. Chairman, there, were, there were eight the questions gentleman. before that that he was not given a chance to answer. I understand, so but I, the witness might have thought. But the witness doesn't, Mr. Chairman, chairman point, point of order. Question. The witness does not control the hang time. On, hang on, exactly right. Members control the time. If they want to switch their question and focus on one more question that they'd like an answer to, I want to give the witness a chance to respond to that final question that Mr. Gates asked. He didn't respond to it. Someone else is going to ask it, I'm sure. We now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee for five minutes.